it's 2012, it's raining outside and you've just come home from school and you run to turn on the Xbox 360, you see a party invite stray away from your friend to jump on the new Call of Duty. After hours of playing, no matter winning or losing, you're still having fun. When your friend comes off for dinner, you decide to jump on a game like Skyrim for a couple of hours and just enjoy some fantasy fun. Finding the massive world impressive, but not being aware of why you find it so impressive or even immersive. The childhood naivety of gaming is something that I think all of us wish we could just fall back into. I remember when the Assassin's Creed 3 trailer came out and I was so hyped to play this game. It would have been the first Assassin's Creed game that I was playing that I knew about before it was coming up to release. So I was hyped and leading up to it, one of the biggest channels on YouTube at the time, Smosh, made a music video talking about it and it just kind of brought in even more hype for the game. I asked my mum if she could pre-order the game from Argos for me so that the day it came out I could just jump straight into it. Then the day finally came. 20th of October 2012, Assassin's Creed 3 finally came out. It was one of the biggest step ups in the franchise since the second game. I would wake up an hour earlier before school just so that I could play it before going. I remember walking around the snow in New York area, turning off my console to then walk in the snow as well at school. This was at the time where the UK actually snowed during the winter, which is something that rarely happens now. All of this childhood nostalgia mixed with naivety of the gaming world all mixed well together to have the most fun possible even by yourself. With every game coming out being a step up from the prior, you had AC1 to AC2 to Brotherhood, all three games were just a one up of each other in some level. But they then jumped to 3 where it took what they already knew and worked to make it something even better. Which at the time wasn't viewed that way, but in fact looking back was actually a great experience. Each Call of Duty was a step up from the next, Halo 4 became bigger in every single way from Halo 3, GTA 5 was one of the biggest jumps in gaming that we've ever seen and probably won't see until GTA 6, and then we also had many new IPs entering the franchise and we had so many amazing games coming out within this time period of games like The Last of Us, GTA 5, Red Dead Redemption, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Dishonored, Shadow of Mordor, Borderlands 2, then leading to games at mid of that decade decade coming out with stuff like The Witcher 3. For me, I would class 2010 to 2015 as the renaissance era of gaming, letting the art drive the ship, whereas during 2016 to 2021 became the industrial revolution, where they were able to just churn out games and make a profit, going higher and higher every single time, testing tons of systems to see which way they could make more money. At the time, we were fine with it, as generally there wasn't a ton of backlash, but all of that would end up ending by 2018, where people started to realise truly what was happening. That was due to the success success of one primary game, obviously there was some backlash before it, but Fortnite blew up and everyone was going a bit crazy. A game that sure was made by one of the biggest companies in gaming, but at the time when it came out, the first four seasons of this game was extremely unpolished and very basic. But it was doing better than every single COG game that had come out from the three years prior. How did a free to play game outperform the rest in this entire market? Well, I think one of the first things to consider obviously is the low barrier to entry, just owning a console of some sort allowed you to play it. And the childhood fun coming back once again for the masses to be able to compete side by side in a gaming world that really we hadn't been in for so long. You could just jump on in your friends or just by yourself and have tons of fun. When I was younger, I remember being able to play for hours on end without any issues. I'd be able to jump on at 4 p.m. right after school and then play every single night until 10 or 11 p.m. I was able to do this because everything was new. I wanted to be better than all of my friends no matter what. I never wanted to be on the same level as them in terms of a competitive standpoint. I simply enjoyed everything I played because my friends also played tons of them. It wasn't just online games that that was the case either. That was also single player games. Being able to walk to school for example or watch videos on YouTube, talking about gaming and whilst it was in its prime, especially back then when YouTube gaming was blowing up and becoming the main course of everything going on in life, at least for obviously people who are between the ages of like 10 and 15. And now I can maybe play a game for like an hour, then I'm wanting to come off. Why is that? Well, I think the first way of discussing that primary topic is going to be talking about the modern day state of gaming across the board. 
I feel like gaming has hit a plateau where it's the same as the tech world, where gaming and tech can't really improve massively between each entry, it is slow changes over time, whereas back in the day every game was a step up in terms of graphics, storytelling, everything, but really one of those can still be improved no matter what, but they just choose to ignore it. Every new iPhone or Samsung phone are always improved from the last, but by such small margins that really it doesn't warrant having an entirely brand new phone every single year. But why do we end up feeling like every single phone has changed every single year? It's because they decide to change it physically, so it looks like there is a big change. With games it's the exact same issue, just replace the iPhone with COD and Samsung with 90% of the AAA titles that are coming out. The reason why this became such a massive issue is that companies didn't want to move the ball forward at all. They only wanted to move an inch if that meant that they made millions from that tiny change. The big issue with the gaming world was when it became such a pathological idea behind money making over the creativity and love for the craft that completely got obliterated once companies realised how much money there is in the gaming sphere. The people who make the decisions at these big companies typically don't play games, and if they do, maybe they play it every now and again or they play it with their kids or grandkids. People who went to uni for game development, or people who got into voice acting because they loved games, just ended up being destroyed by the machine that is modern day gaming. Companies like Ubisoft and Activision know that they'll make a load of money by putting out a load of subpar games instead of risking it to make even more money because they make an amazing game. Last year was the first ever time Activision decided to take a year off of making Call of Duty games. It was the same for Ubisoft, because back when they released Assassin's Creed Syndicate, it was met with a lot of backlash because there was nothing changing in the franchise. They took a year off and released Origins, a game that to this day I still think is one of the best Assassin's Creed games. Which is overall a good thing, them taking a year off is proof that they know that something needed to change. Work had to be put in to release good games. But due to the corporatization and the lack of willingness to try new projects, people ended up with the same game that was slightly improved year to year. Now we're at the point where games just can't improve dramatically when it comes to the graphics or audio, the quality is pretty much as high as it can be. The only way that games can improve now is by having a compelling story and world design that's actually intriguing to run around. I end up finding myself wanting to run around Elden Ring for example, a game that I suck at, I get destroyed in, I do not do well in Souls-like games. However, there is something about the world design in that game that is phenomenal in comparison to all of the Ubisoft games when it comes to the new generation. Assassin's Creed. I don't want to run around Viking England in Assassin's Creed Valhalla where the world is so dull that you end up putting your horse into auto sprint and looking at TikTok or YouTube for 15 minutes until your horse gets to your destination. But it's not just down to the creative compression that's gone on within the gaming world, but it's also the fact that there's a lack of just excitement for new releases in the gaming world right now. Now the lack of care for the new releases to me comes down to two main things. One is just growing up, and the second thing, like I've previously discussed, when you were a kid, everything you played was new. Everything was always a brand new experience. When I played GTA 4 when I was younger, I thought that that was the only thing of its kind. But that was the fourth game in the main line of the franchise. When I played Saints Row 2 for the first time, I loved that game and that's the only Saints Row game that I truly enjoyed. But at that point of time, again, I thought that that was the only thing like it and that there was no way of improving it. But then after growing up, you start to realise things. For example, the Saints Row franchise all take massive inspiration from GTA. Skyrim was the fifth game in a two decade long franchise, but to me it was the first of its kind. I could keep going with a mixture of childish ignorance about the world itself and the lack of knowledge in the gaming world specifically. But due to the lack of knowledge, it actually made gaming a great experience, and I think this is something that people don't talk about when they're talking about the nostalgia of games. They solely put it down to a, we just loved the games when we were growing up, but it's because those experiences were new experiences to us. We didn't have a critical eye at that point. A lot of people try to defend the stance that it's not because we grew up, it's just that games became stale and boring. I agree with half of that statement. The half that I agree with is the stale and boring part of the statement. However, I do also think that people who complain about games being bad are a lot of the time the people who also play the same types of games over and over again, such as the FPS types. When the new COG game isn't good, they believe that gaming is ruined. When Halo is boring, they believe again the industry sucks and that everything about it is bad. But instead of them taking some time out of their days to play something really interesting and play an amazing story-rich game that came before many of the COG games for example, or 
even games recent like Red Dead 2 where you get an amazing story, they don't want to do that because they view it as a waste of time. Why would they spend so many hours in a game like Red Dead when really they could play COD every hour every day and apparently get the same level of fun? Another part of getting older is the realisation that gaming truly doesn't matter. Before you start writing in the comment sections about how you're a 25 or 40 year old man who loves playing games and still talks about it all the time, just remember that you are not the majority of people. Most men and women do not care about games in the first place, let alone started playing them. It's not until really my generation, which is for example Gen Z and Millennials, where you have that barrier where so many people played games. I remember so many people in school who played games. This was across the board, no matter who they were, they tried playing games because it was a great hobby to play when you're younger. You could sink so much time into it. With a lot of people holding the belief of gaming being dead comes down to the realization that gaming truly doesn't matter. Adulting starts to kick in and you become aware of a lot more things outside of this bubble that most of us who loved games growing up were sat in for so long. Now what you should and shouldn't care about is not what I'm talking about here. I believe that gaming is obviously a hobby, it's something that should be put in and categorised as such. For example, a lot of people who say the words gaming is a waste of time also are the same sorts of people who go and spend two hours of their life watching a football match every Saturday, then discussing it for hours on end throughout the week, and they basically become walking contradictions. It's depressing, but becoming aware that responsibility strips us of our innate childlike persona that will always be there, but only comes out of very specific things, as we've basically been trained most of our lives to put that aside, because obviously we have to start stepping up to becoming an adult. A big part of adulting is that realisation of how much games cost. How is The Last of Us Part 1 £70? It's a remake, sure, but come on, that's ridiculous. Overall, it's not just because it's the same game from before just with updated graphics, that's not my issue with the game, it's the fact that £70 is a ridiculous amount of money to be paying for a game. Sure, people may use the argument of, well you go out and you spend £70 on stuff, currently, I don't, I still have no money. Most of my money is gone, purely because, guess what, my car costs over £70 to fill up, it's stupid. It's not even like you could turn around and say, well, the cost of everything's going up, so we need to start charging the game more. Because it's not that. Most of these games that come out at £70 already have a ridiculous amount of monetization in them. It makes people not want to play games because there's such a high barrier to entry now that you have to pay £70 to play a game, and even £50 for some games is ridiculous. How is, for example, many of the Nintendo games still at their ridiculously high price tag when they're like five years old? It's absurd. As let's say you're earning £1,200 a month, maybe £1,500 a month. The average salary, for example, in the UK, if you're on a living wage, you're going to be getting just around £1,500. That is living wage, that's not minimum, so you'll be taking home less than that if you just go off of minimum wage. It still ends up becoming a massive chunk of your money from all of the money that you end up having left over after all of your bills. I still live with my parents and will do for some time. I know that I will not be able to afford the newest games right away all the time. It's something that I've had to come to accept. When after everything comes out of my account, I'm only left with like 120 to maybe 200 pounds a month. And paying 60 pounds for a game just isn't doable. Everything is going up in price, so I'm not fully surprised, obviously. Like, yes, I said earlier how, for example, it's ridiculous because everything's going in price, you can't use that as an argument. But again, it's like one of those things where people can use it and people will defend that argument, so I guess, sure. But when you consider that there's so many multiplayer titles out there that make tons of money, that have not needed to increase the price. Let's talk about two of the most popular games in history, Fortnite and Minecraft. Fortnite and Minecraft, for example, are, like I said, two of the most profitable games in history to ever be made. One of them is free and makes tons of money from microtransactions. I'm fine with that being a system that earns money. The game initially is free. You don't need to buy the microtransactions. You're getting value for literally paying nothing. I don't believe all games should be free, so don't worry, don't take it like that. I believe games should be charged for. But when games make tons of money, and Epic has proved this point, Fortnite has made so much money they didn't need the game to be paid for in the first place. The other, for example, was at £16 for the first five years of this game coming out. The game currently is £20. It is £20 and it still ends up selling tons every year. But how did a game that is £16 per game that you're buying of Minecraft end up becoming one of the most profitable games in history. 
So it can be done as long as games are actually good enough, have a great gameplay loop, and there is actually quality changes that are happening. It doesn't need to always be about making your game as profitable as possible. Releasing a new Call of Duty every year at £60 a year, charging a ridiculous amount of money for season passes, and then shoving in tons of microtransactions. The games don't need to be like that. Focus on making a good game first, and then you can justify charging that money. Like I previously discussed, I do believe one of the biggest issues in gaming right now is the creativity being stomped out by monetary gain, as both should work in tandem together. The better your game is, the higher chances it will sell well. Good reviews end up turning into more and more money. It's a blatantly obvious fact that has been shown time and time again, which is a shift I think we might be seeing and I will discuss in a moment, but that is not where we're at right now. But the last two points that I want to make when it comes to gaming today is the lack of fun and how the older I get, the more critical I became of games. Now, the first part, I think, is something that a lot of us can agree on no matter what, which is that gaming just isn't as fun anymore to play for long periods of time. I can't play games for more than two hours at a time without feeling either drained or as if I've just wasted two hours of my life. The only time that doesn't happen is if I had a really great time. Be that with my friends or a game that's been so compelling, when I end up turning it off, I just want to continue playing, which again has been very rare over the last five years. When my friends end up playing games for like four hours straight, it just feels weird to me now. I used to be able to do it so much and I just can't now. I've got a bad relationship when it comes to productivity within games, which I've discussed previously, but I will make a video on at some point. But when it comes to it, I just end up feeling annoyed at myself, typically because I feel like I've wasted time. But also, I always end up on edge afterwards just because of the way I have to be like zoned in so heavily with games for me to care about them in any way. Everything about me when I play games just becomes more negative, And this is an issue that's not just with me. The amount of times I've conversations conversations with people who talk about quitting games and from my own experience of when I quit for like half a year during 2019, I end up thinking back to that time quite often and I just think about how generally I was a lot happier. Maybe that's because gaming is more of an addiction for me and that I have to try and toe the line between it and not let it spiral. But really, I don't know. I could be addicted to games and that's the reason why I have a negative issue and try my best not to play them as much. I know that I sink too much time into them when I get into them and that's why I typically don't to let myself play games that much. But then there's the critical side. I became more critical of games over the years and now I have a channel where the main piece of content that I focus on is big video game essays. But when you get older, you start to realise more and more about the gaming world as a whole than you ever saw beforehand when you were younger. You see the legalities of it, the acquisitions, the way staff get treated, and much more, and it ends up giving you such a negative point of view on many different games that the younger version of your naive self that used to trash on games like Call of Duty Ghosts, for example, because your favourite YouTuber was telling you it's awful, just didn't know about. You are basically ending up falling into the trap of everyone else's belief systems obviously because that's just how things work anyway but in turn it's something that all of us fall into the trap of nowadays if a game gets released and it doesn't live up to an expectation that you had even if they didn't set that expectation you'll have a critical viewpoint of it and then obviously you have the latter half of people's viewpoints which is the idea that you should just be grateful for what you got which is a stance that i don't agree with either all of this ends up adding up until the day that you feel as if everything you dislike has a justifiable criticism and now we just end up playing games and hope that we're going to be able to catch lightning in a bottle twice and relive our childhood and to be honest as bad as it is to say it just won't ever happen before i talk about some of the more positive aspects of why i think that gaming isn't dead or at least we're entering a world where gaming is becoming a little bit better i also want to talk about some of the outliers over the last four years and i'm also going to compare it against 2010 to 2014 uh, the reason why i did this because again i consider that five-year gap 2010 to 2015 as the renaissance era and then 2016 to 2021 for example as the just everything being released for the sake of making tons and tons of money but during that period even if you took 2016 to then 2020 you're still going to have the same result that i've come to realize from this list as really, during 2018 to 2022, it hasn't all been doom and gloom. We know that. I think the best way of talking about a lot of these games is in order of release. I found about eight games on the lists of games that came out in the last four years. They've actually been standout games. 
which works out to two games a year, which isn't bad. But when you look at the years between 2010 and 2014, with games like Red Dead 1, Halo Reach, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, Black Ops 1, Arkham City, Skyrim, Deus Ex Human Revolution, Modern Warfare 3, Dishonored, Borderlands 2, Mass Effect 3, Far Cry 3, Halo 4, Black Ops 2, Hitman Absolution, Sleeping Dogs, Last of Us, GTA 5, Bioshock Infinite, Assassin's Creed Black Flag, Pokemon X and Y, Crisis 3, Shadow of Mordor, Destiny 1, Far Cry 4, Titanfall 1, and Dark Souls 2. All of those games came out between that four year span, and some of those games are somewhere within the good and amazing category. But again, let's talk about the outliers, as I do believe they do deserve some level of conversation anyway. The list itself is Red Dead 2, God of War, Spider-Man, Star Wars Fallen Order, Ghost of Tsushima, Last of Us Part 2, It Takes Two, and Elden Ring. The first game on this list that I'm going to talk about is Red Dead 2. If you want to see a full video essay talking about this, make sure to go check out the three hour long video that I put out. But anyway, let's continue on this topic. This game to me stood out for two main reasons, the quality of the product and the story itself within the game. Now the game was a massive jump in quality and we haven't seen this jump since GTA 5 came out. And it's something that only a company like Rockstar can do in my opinion. The game world feels real and the story is also amazingly well told. This game's world is something that no other game has been able to pull off, which is a relatively boring time in history, non-fantasy world, that is appealing to just walk around in due to the random encounters within the game and utilising the 40 second rule very well. Then you have a game like God of War, which is again another game that is considered one of the best games and beat Red Dead 2 as game of the year for 2018, which is a story about a father and son bonding together. I haven't fully played the game yet, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but from general consensus, this game is considered one of the best and most amazing stories told. And the reason why this game performed so well is because they were able to do two things very very well together. They mixed the gamer's love of skull crushing enemies with an axe and a story that is relatable on many levels. It's a game that I can't wait to play and when I do, like I mentioned, I will be making a video out of it, as it's something that I always hear about over and over again. Then you have Spider-Man, which is a game that again, I love for two reasons. Its narrative was really enjoyable and I think they pulled off a story about Spider-Man in a game and made loads of villains work really well together without it feeling as if they cut any corners. But also because they took what they knew worked from the Arkham franchise and just gave it to Spider-Man with a little bit of a twist with a new story that again was believable and was one of the actual most heart-wrenching stories I've played in a good while. Again, it's just another standout of these times. You've then got Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, which I will be making again another big video about it, but if you want some views of this game, I do have a video talking about the importance of this game, as I do truly believe this was one of the most important games to come out recently. As to me, what this game pulled off was proving to everyone that EA were wrong about the industry at large, that single player games were not profitable. They believed that, they thought single player gaming was dead, and what did they do? They released a single player game, which is one of their best selling games when it comes to anything close to what they did with FIFA, for example, or The Sims. Then you've got Ghost of Tsushima, which again is another game that I haven't got round to playing. I do have it, so I will be playing it very soon. However, everything that I hear about the game is what people praise Assassin's Creed for, but they've done so much better within this game than the likes of Odyssey or Valhalla. The lack of Assassin's Creed in the title, obviously because it's not made by Ubisoft, made it an open world game that people enjoy enjoyed without feeling like they were forced to take a specific path. This game showed for one of the first times a true samurai story that you've ever seen in gaming. And then you have The Last of Us Part 2, which yes, it was one of the more controversial ones on this list. I do think though the game excelled in one thing and that was quality. This game showed us how amazing a game can look and how great quality they can make a game stand out in comparison to every single game out there from a visual standpoint and video game acting standpoint. I know that people hate the game for some justifiable reasons. For example, obviously the storytelling is a little bit lackluster over the, you know, the constant up and downs of the story story but it's something that I will be talking about again in a future video. It Takes Two is a game that's very simple to explain why people loved it so much, and that is because over the last eight years, Couch Co-op Gaming has basically just fallen into the sidelines. No games are really made with co-op in mind anymore, at least Couch Co-op Gaming, to the point where many different Call of Duties don't even have it as a feature anymore. Whereas this game was actually great fun to play, and it was just something that reminded me of playing games like Halo 3, for example, playing through the campaign with me and my 
friend sat there. Then you have Elden Ring, which does everything right, most things anyway. I don't really want to get too much into Elden Ring as I feel like every single YouTuber on the planet has spoken about this game very well, but I did want to talk about how they basically took the idea of open world gaming and explored it to the very heart of the concept. I don't even know personally what's going on half the time when I'm running around in the world itself, but I end up finding myself just enjoying the time that I spend running around the map. It was a game that was just a step up across the board in terms of everything from a gameplay perspective that has not been touched anywhere near within the last two years. But all of those games have two things in common. They're all pretty much single player games, besides it takes two. But to me, that game is a couch co-op game, so it's kind it's not single player obviously because you're playing with another person, but to me it's meant to be played as a couch co-op experience, so it's close to single player. All of these games though were either a one-up of everything that came before or had an amazing compelling narrative. And sometimes both. Both. And most of the games nowadays aren't doing that. They just try to make what they knew worked before and keep making it over and over again, hoping people still care about it if you make it look slightly different. So instead of improving the baseline of what they consider good enough, they try and improve side areas that truly don't matter as much. But I'm actually hopeful. I think many of these games show a reason, and Elden Ring is one of the first ones. Now in terms of any game that has broken any of the current world beliefs of gaming, I think Elden Ring is the modern day standout of what people want in a game. This game proved to the world that companies can release great games that live up to the hype. It's one of the two games in my opinion that was able to set aside this idea, and Red Dead 2 is the other game in there. Every single game besides that either failed to live up to the hype or had no hype at all. Which again is fine, I think hype is what kills a lot of games to be honest. But this game was able to prove everyone wrong in the idea of what gaming companies are like. They didn't need a ton of microtransactions to make a load of money, it doesn't need to be full of multiplayer mechanics where obviously you can play online but you don't need to do it. It proved that people do care just about having a good game over a game that fits everyone's needs. Not only this though, but all the games that I mentioned earlier, like I mentioned, were all single player games. Why is it that we haven't had a truly great game since Fortnite when it comes to a multiplayer perspective that brings everyone in? You might say, oh well Warzone did it. Warzone kind of did for like two months during a lockdown period where they got very lucky with the time and setting of what the world was like when it released. Or you could say Apex, but again, it's a battle royale that sure, people do care about, but it isn't on the same level as what Warzone was on or Fortnite. Really, the only game coming out that most people want to play when it comes to a battle royale at this point will be Warzone 2.0. I just don't feel like right now there is any big multiplayer game that people can actually rally behind and find amazing, which is then leading to more people experiencing a load of these single player games that they just didn't decide to play because they loved playing the new Call of Duty every year. Solo games though are starting to make a comeback, or at least I think they are. Personally, I see more and more people becoming more and more hyped for single player games than multiplayer games. I think that that is for a good reason though. A lot of gamers have come to the realisation that multiplayer games are great for their main function. Enjoyment together and having a competitive edge, but almost all of the games lack one thing and that is depth. When the only games that you play are multiplayer, and maybe you play a little bit more than some of your friends play and you're a little bit more addicted than they are, you start to become more and more down the stream, which I would class as gaming depression, which is where you basically only play a subset of games under the illusion that you're enjoying the game, when in reality, you do not enjoy it by any means, you just can't imagine not playing it. But with single player games, you're allowed to actually enjoy something for more than just the gameplay. You get to enjoy a story, a narrative, a world, something that really a lot of the single player games that you will want to play have amazing and have been doing great things for such a long time within those areas. Look at all the communities around some of the most best selling games and franchises and films and everything in the world. All of them have rabid fan bases because they have depth, not because they are shallow. Now not only is the gaming world becoming more and more changed due to people loving story content, but you also have gaming companies being held way more accountable than they've ever been for the actions that they cause. The games that I'll discuss in this are things like Cyberpunk, Fallout 76, Warzone and The Last of Us Part 2. All of these games shared a level of public backlash and companies knowing that they had messed up. Which is a good thing. I don't believe companies should be held to such views where they can't do anything right, as there's always a way to improve every single game, but I believe that when something is truly bad, it does need to be called out. 
and the companies do need to be held accountable for. Money is what they're after when it comes to any games coming out, and the only way that you can truly tell them and make them aware that the games they're releasing suck is just by not buying their games, and the money is what is backing them more than anything. Which ends up coming down to us as the customer base having to make these decisions. Cyberpunk is the best example of this ever to exist, and we've already talked about this before in the gaming community at large, but what it ended up proving is that if you release a game that is as broken as it was, as unfinished, no matter what the company's reputation prior was, you can't get away with releasing a terrible game. When I heard about Cyberpunk about six months before its release, I remember talking to my friends on a bike ride and I said to them, this game will die purely because there is too much hype around it. It's for the same reason why I'm scared for a game like Elder Scrolls 6, because I want the game to be amazing. However, I know that the closer and closer we get, the community will become so ridiculously over the top about what they expect for this game that it could end up killing the game before it even releases. However, the game wasn't killed just solely down to the hype. I don't think that's all you can blame it down to. I think the game was awful primarily because of two reasons. The game was way too ambitious, but also the higher ups pushed out a game way before it was anywhere near finished. They ended up believing they could do more than they could actually handle. Cyberpunk was in development before The Witcher 3 was out anyway, and I do think that they had an ambition for that game, and once The Witcher 3 came out and did amazingly well, their ego probably grew a little bit too big. But the company was proved wrong, and that took a massive hit on their reputation, and they made another massive hit against their company in the value of the company. So they definitely won't be making the same mistake as they did with Cyberpunk ever again, and I think there is going to be a very rare instances where companies will come close to doing the same thing. Fallout 76 is the next game that didn't hit the mark on what they promised initially. By many miles, everyone knows this game is just somehow clinging to life, which has now been given full control to by the people who made Rust. Another game in this list as well of multiplayer games is Warzone. It's a game that was so broken that people love the game, but when it started to alter people's overall views, it wasn't just big streamers that were affected by people who stream sniped, for example. It was because every game that you played, one in three chances, you were going to be running into bugs or hackers. It was ridiculous, it was stupid, and... There has not been a game that's come that close to as bad of a multiplayer reputation as Warzone 1.0. After two lackluster releases from Call of Duty, they ended up having to take a year off, and that is one thing that people did want them to do for a while. Take a year off and release a game that actually is good. For a company like Activision, not to release a new game is another proof of concept that the world is changing in the world of gaming and that companies are being held accountable way more than they were five years ago. And then you have The Last of Us 2, which is one of the games that, honestly, it's an anomaly that I mentioned. However, also the story was heavily polarizing. And one thing that this game proved is that you can't just release a narrative that you believe is good when a lot of your players are not the people who are going to love the nuance of playing as the villain when they don't want to play as the person who killed one of the most likable characters ever in gaming. It's not just down to the fact that you're playing as Abby that was the issue, it's the fact that she was generally just unlikable. The story itself flows so in and out, all over the time, and going up and down like as if you're on a full-blown roller coaster is ridiculous. And what Last of Us 2 proved yet again is that even if you aced the first game, it doesn't mean you'll be able to do it twice. The fans know more than the creators. That's one thing that people do get wrong sometimes. I believe that the idea that customers don't know what they want until they're shown it. However, I do also believe the idea that fans, if there is that much backlash about something you've done in the game, you have messed up. The other issue with The Last of Us 2 was just that it was a really depressing game. The first game had hope within it. The second game doesn't. There is none of it. Now that we're in the conclusion part of this video, let's just talk about some things just off the top of my head. I'm very aware that obviously gaming is not dead from a monetary standpoint. I also don't believe gaming is necessarily dead. I think we're now entering a new stage where companies are being held accountable for what they make for the first time, properly anyway, because obviously there was accountability beforehand. But nowadays, gaming has got so much more of a bigger light on it and its market share dominates now in the entertainment community, or at least is heavily dominant, let's say. But really, it's something that they now actually have to look into is making good games. And another thing I want to mention within this, and it's something that I will make a video on properly, uh, which is when I'm talking about gaming being a waste of time, I don't believe that it's solely a waste of time just because obviously you could be doing so much better with it. Because that's the issue for myself, is when I play games, I end up down this belief that, oh, I could be doing so much better things for myself. However, I then realise that obviously, would I actually be doing the things I think I would be doing when not playing games? 
Probably not. But also, I do stand by the idea that for you to enjoy life, you have to have downtime in between the moments of being absurdly productive. So it's not the case that I think everything is awful and that you shouldn't play games. I do love games, so don't worry about that. And the other thing is that I do think that there are companies out there that do want to release good games. I do think that companies are wanting to currently make great games again that have a great interesting narrative, purely because if they don't, they're failing nowadays. If you do not make a game with a great narrative and all that it's got going for it is multiplayer, it may work for some. However, if you want to dominate a market, which most games want to do, they don't want to just take a little portion of it. They want the whole thing, or at least as much as they can take. They don't need to release a lackluster story with a good multiplayer. That's not how it works. Just release both and have them at a good standard as well. Now, that all being said, this is the end of the video now. So obviously, if you guys did enjoy this video, make sure to leave a like and do subscribe for more content. I upload gaming content every Friday and whatever I want on Wednesdays. This video is one of the think piece sort of videos that I'm going to do every now and again. It's something that I only do for things that are topics that I find actually interesting. The last video that I did this for uh, was talking about the idea of productivity within gaming, how maybe you should try quitting games for a period of time to then learn how you deal with it, as I feel, feel like a lot of people who hold the belief that you should never quit gaming or that uh, gaming is not bad for you in any way are typically the ones who are addicted to games. And that if you take a little bit of a break, you may find yourself enjoying life more. And if you do enjoy life more, you may choose to either completely stop or at least take a step back and start doing more things in your life that you enjoy over playing games. But yeah, with that all being said, like I mentioned, if you did enjoy, make sure to leave a like, do subscribe for more content on this channel, and I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good one.